Welcome to another episode of The Trenches. Today, we got one of my mentors and a Utah Ute legend, Steve Fafita. What's up, Coach? Appreciate you for coming out. Uh, I want you to be able to say your name. You say your name with so much more pride than I do. Introduce yourself. Yeah, my name's Steve Fifita. Um, yeah, I've known Nico for a long time, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, what does the Fafita last name mean? Um, I mean, you know, it means a lot of things to me, but uh, mostly it's just um, it's something that I, I take a great, uh, great deal of pride in is um, what my father raised us up to be is just, we always got to stick together. Our family is raised to, um, you know, we look out for each other more um, than we look out for ourselves. And, um, you know, these past couple of years have been a testament to the, um, what my last name means is because it's been a, a couple of trying years um, and, and my family's held true to um, sticking with me, not just my family, but um, my wife's family, but anybody that comes comes near our family knows that family's first and uh, that's what my last name means to me. Okay, and how do you know when a last name is either Tongan or Samoan? Like, I always wondered that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I don't have a, the answer to that one. Okay, um, if someone who isn't Polynesian, what are some things that they need to know when trying to recruit a Polynesian player, you feel like? Yeah, I think some of the things is, um, you know, one big thing is Polynesians recruit each other. Um, so, you know, when you have guys on the staff or guys on the team, it makes it easier to, to recruit those, those guys. Um, I think another thing that is huge is just being, you know, genuine people, um, like humble, genuine, you know, um, I don't think a lot of people like too much of the showy stuff where, you know, we're real down to the um, real basic. Like if you show us that you love us, um, you're going to look out for us and just tell us the truth, even if it's a hard truth. Um, I think those are the few things that when you're recruiting a Polynesian kid, that those are important. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the reasons why I even ended up going to Idaho State was because you was a shorter defensive lineman. Like I felt like at being 6'1", you was going to be able to show me you know how to be successful at that size. How was it for you coming up being a shorter defensive lineman? Nah, you see, that's pretty question I get a lot is um, people just think that just because I was a shorter guy, you know, I'm just going to go and recruit shorter guys. Um, but I have some principles that I that I use to recruit guys. Um, but if they're smaller guys, one of the things I like to focus on is making sure they have pop and they're a little more polished. Um, than what you see with a uh, with a bigger guy, right? So when I'm recruiting a guy, I want to make sure they got that, that little twitch off the ball, right? They're hitting through contact, um, and then I also want to just make sure that they're a little bit cleaner with their their hands, their footwork, right? They have a little bit better hips. They have a natural feel for making plays. Um, I want to see that polish um, in smaller guys, and the reason I'm like that is I don't want to just recruit a, a regular guy. Is I didn't know. Um, size was a detriment until I got to the NFL where, you know, my talent um, was kind of matched by other guys. That's when I realized that being smaller is a detriment to you, you know. So um, I just want to make sure when I get guys that are smaller that they're very efficient in what they do. And how did, how did your size affect you at the University of Utah and why did you even decide to go there? Utah, the, Utah, the funny one. I always wanted to go there. I had a high school coach, uh, Jimmy Nolan, who played there, um, and he always pushed, you know, he always pushed the Utes on me. And then I just fell in love with all the Polynesian kids they had there, um, you know. And I went to school in Orange County, California. Um, we had a couple other Polynesian kids on our team, but it wasn't like what they had at Utah, you know. So when I got there, and, and I just started meeting the guys and um, fell in love with that environment. So that was that was one of the main reasons. Um, I went there and they were the only school that recruited me to play D-line. Um, and I didn't know they were recruiting me to play D-line. I thought they were recruiting me to play fullback. Um, and then after, you know, after I signed with them and everything had gone down, um, I was up to about 265, 270. You know, I finished my senior season about 230. And I remember the coach going, uh, I tell him, like, I'm going to get in shape. Don't worry, I'll be good. Um, when I get up there, and he's like, don't worry about it, just you're going to play D-line. <laughs> and that's when I kind of found out. I mean, looking back, I should have known now that I've gone through the whole recruiting process. 
I know like what to look for and where they're gonna kind of place you. Okay. But when I was a young kid, I didn't. I got felt like I got blindsided by it. When saying like you know what to look for now, when you turn on film, like when you was a coach at Idaho State, what's in the first three clips? What's some of the three th like three of the main things you're looking for? Yeah, well, so like my my recruiting thing was built on five. I call them five P's, right? So the first one was pop. I want to see guys that have a pop to them, right? I want to see guys that have polish, like I talked about. Then the next one, I mean, you don't really even have to turn on the video, but I want to see polish, right? So I want to see those three things when I, uh, um, I'm sorry, I want to see potential, right? So pop, polish, potential. I want to see those things when I uh, evaluate the guy. Then the other two are, um, I want to see them in person. So I call it person, but I want to see the person or the kid in person and evaluate them. And then I want to just kind of know what kind of person they are. Um, and then the fifth one, I call it Polynesian, um, but really it's, it's whatever preference you have. Right? Yeah. So for me, it was Polynesian kids. I like to recruit. I was looking for something that connected me to those kids um, more than just football, you know? So like whatever preference it was, like, so if it was an in-state kid, it made sense. You know, smaller D lineman, it made sense. Polynesian kids obviously was an easy fit, but those were the five things I looked for um, when I evaluated. What did you see when you turned on my film? We loved it. When I turned on your video, we loved it. Um, you had that pop, right? You had that potential. We knew you were playing big time ball, going against big time guys coming out of Riverside. Um, but yeah, I, I remember me and Spencer just sitting there and being like, all right, if we get this kid, it doesn't matter who else we get on the class. <laughs> we're going to feel good about what we've done. Um, and that was actually my first home visit I ever did. I remember you told me that yeah. after when yeah. I got up there. So that was my first home visit I ever did. Um, but yeah, when we turned on that video and we saw that pop, you know, then I talked to Coach Penn over there um, and he just, you know, had all those good things to say. And we're like, yeah, if we get this kid, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good recruiting class for us, no matter what else happens. Uh, yeah, I because that was my, I think that was my first home visit too. I was like, dang, I don't even know these dudes. They're going to come over. I don't even know what to do. I was like, <laughs> it, it was like so weird, just the whole process about it. But y'all just see... It's like when y'all left, it seemed like I knew y'all for a minute. It was like I felt like I felt cool about it because I remember I kind of had to make a decision kind of early because that was like early December. You know, the JUCO signing day was like December 18th or something like that. Um, what was one of the most memorable games that you had at Utah? Um, my favorite game being at Utah is uh, when we played BYU my sophomore year. Um, they hadn't been shut out and I don't know, it was a long, they had the longest streak of not being shut out. And we ended up in like a blizzard. We ended up winning three to zero um, and shut them out. One, you know, our rivalry game. You know, a lot of people talk about another game um, that we were successful in. So my favorite game was, was the BYU one. Which, which one do you feel like other people talk about? A lot of people talk about, you know, the Fiesta Bowl um, and that whole season that we had. Um, but my, my favorite was shutting out BYU um, you know, and, and our coach called it, you know, Kyle said before the game, he's like, these guys haven't been shut out. You know, he's a BYU alumni, so he's like, I want to get this one under my belt. Um, and then doing it and winning three to zero, you know, was a, was a big deal. Was that the one that, um, that you was able to run a touchdown in? No. What was no. the one that you ran a touchdown in? So that was my junior year. That was my junior Wasn't it against year. BYU? Against BYU, yeah. So my junior year, BYU. Um, that one was a blowout, you know, so that one wasn't as fun for me. I know in California, it's like this D1 or bust type mentality for kids and parents that are seeking this Division One. You being a coach before, give it to them in a way like, what is a coach really asking you when he says, I want you to come play for me? Like, what is a coach's expectation? Because a lot of people think it's just, Oh, I'm big, fast. I'm gonna just do what I'm doing right now. But they don't know it's so much more behind it, and everyday tasks they got to get done. Um, kind of yeah. explain that process. Well, I think just the biggest misconception is for for kids when they get to college is that um, it's gonna be just like what they went through in high school. You know, like um, you're gonna get away with a lot of those bad habits. And I also think what happens is, and this is kind of what happened to me is, um, if you're good enough you will get away with that, right? A lot of people are not that, you know, a lot of people are not that much better than the competition when they get there. Mm -hmm. um, but when you meet that, that resistance, 
you know, that's where you see the real guys that are going to be successful. That's where you see them shine. Um, and there's a lot of places where you can stumble in college. You know, you can stumble from being homesick, right? You can stumble from the amount of work. Um, you know, the, the schedules are real strict, you know, unlike, uh, unlike high school. Yeah, you know, high school kids, is, um, their day's kind of set, but it's not as strict as like you're going, waking up, going to work out, then you've got classes. Um, the other thing is, even though you have these strict schedules, there's also a lot of freedom. You know, nobody's there to wake you up. Nobody's there to put you to bed, wait till you walk in the door, right? So there's a lot of that freedom. So you have this strict schedule when things are set up, but you also have um, this amount of freedom. And usually the first thing to go is uh, when guys got to pick between sleep or going to class, right? Or sleep or doing something uh, like working out. The first thing that's going to go is, is going to class and guys are going to get their sleep over going to class. Um, so I think it's a good balance of understanding the amount of uh, structure that's going to be there, study hall, all that stuff, and then managing that with, uh, um, with the flexibility you got in your off hours um, and just being responsible with handling both. Uh, yeah, I definitely think the freedom kills a lot of people when they get there just because it's like they've never, nobody's ever been on them. And then it's like when you get to college and somebody's on you about every single thing, about the socks you wear, about the, like, it's just socks. Why does that matter? And when I was a player, I was like, I don't know, just do it. But when I was a coach, I see it because it's like the more attention to detail that you can pay attention to, it's just like it carries on to the whole game. But like when I was a G, I really got to see a whole different side of like football. I was so fortunate to get that. And speaking of that, why did you even, why did you give me a chance to be a GA? Cause I was like, when Kramer left, I was like, oh, it ain't no way I'm getting up in here. And then we were like, uh, you might not be able to get it. I'm kind of asking. And then coach Finn was like, well, it's up to you. And then I was like, damn, I don't think, I don't know if I've been a good enough guy to get that. So it's like, why did you let, why did you kind of put yourself on the line to let me come in there? How, why did you feel like I'll do a good job? Um, well, it wasn't only me, you know, like Coop, Spence, mm. um, you know, everybody was on on the same page with that. Um, and it just kind of goes back to like uh, those little details, you know, and I remember this story. I'll always remember the story about, um, you know, that, that great that check. That great check. Right? <laughs> and that's what I tell, and I, that's what I kind of tell guys is, um, if, you know, when, when it's on the line, you know, you know, as a coach, when the head coach is on you about little stuff, you know, you don't want to have to be keep bugging the kids about it. And I remember that time and I said, Nico, you know, you, you know, I got in your ass a little bit. and I said, hey, we need to get this thing done. And um, I was like, we've all gone to bat, you know, and we've all done this. And from that moment on, we never had an issue. Um, and that's why I knew you'd be a good guy. Like, you know, that's kind of how I am. When somebody looks out for me, right, if they ask me to do something, I'm going to do it. No matter or I'm going to try my hardest to yeah. do it, no matter how hard it is. Um, if people are looking out for me, I, that's, I'll look out for them. You know, and I have one of those rules, um, you know, don't, don't fuck me, me. <laughs> I, I won't fuck you, right? So that's one of the rules. You look out for me, I look yeah. out for you, right? And it kind of goes both ways. Um, and when you have that kind of relationship with guys, right, you know you can be successful even beyond football. I don't feel like I even really had a good, because we talked a little bit after graduation, but stuff was flying out so fast, like, I don't think you know how much of a uh, like life changer it was for me to be able to get to that. Cause it's like my whole life playing football, only seen it from the player's view. And then not only the fact that I got to add something to my resume with getting that master's degree, it was like to be able to see football in that different realm, like it, taking that step back, so much of it made sense. Cause before it was like, I was just doing it cause I was told. And it was like being a GA, I'm like, I didn't know how good it was going to be until I was in it and learning. It was like, it made me grow up so much and figure out so much just about the game and even just how to be an adult. Cause it was like, bro, if I miss one of these meetings, everybody like team meetings, like, man, you might slither in there or you just got to hear from your coach. You might run at 6 a.m. But it was like, bro, all them coaches going to be in there if I don't show up in there. Like, it really just made me grow up super fast. And then um, what happened as soon as when I was about to be a GA my first summer, like, that made me grow up super fast. I was like, I was just playing with them last year. Like, what happened? 
<laughs> is there any way that I can like help him out? And we can talk about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my first summer when you had that, when you got that DUI, and I learned so much in them like three weeks because I have basically became like the interim D line coach with Coach Tune. And it's like, how did you? I can only imagine what was going on because I was like, I felt stressed out and all I had to worry about was the D-line. You had to worry about us, your family, yourself. Like, you kind of, I'm assuming that you felt like you let everyone down. Like, how did you even handle that? And what was the emotions trying to come back to conquer yourself back on that? Like, Well, um, you know, I still haven't conquered. I mean, it's been, I think, maybe five, six years since then, mm-hmm. um, you know, in alcoholism. I've gone almost two years now without drinking, but I went eight years before that um, without drinking. And then I started, you know, the stress of it, of that profession kind of got me back on that road. Um, but anyway, I, I'm still battling with um, figuring that side of it out. Um, but I'm kind of better when uh, my back's against the wall. You know, I'm better when... Um, I hit rock bottom. I'm better, you know, when things are stacked against me is when I'm at my best. When things are kind of going well or I'm just kind of in this stagnant place, um, that's kind of not, not the, the best for me. And that's kind of what I'm working on right now is trying to figure out how to maintain even when things are, you know, going against or, you know, not going my way as much. Um, but, yeah, I'm still battling with that. But as far as that time when I came back, um, you know, I remember the first day I came back and I just started, you know, getting back out there. You know, I coach hard. I was yelling at the kids a lot. And I remember one of the other coaches just asked me, like, you know, how do you keep pushing these kids and asking them to do um, this stuff when, you know, you're out here fucking up? And I remember telling him just, I don't ask the kids to be perfect. You know, like, I'm not trying to teach the kids to be perfect. I'm not telling them to not make mistakes. But, um, you know, I was telling them, try to learn from your mistakes and get better. Um, and don't keep making the same mistakes over and over. Um, you know, so that's what I preached to the guys. And, you know, I should have been preaching to myself because I was making similar mistakes over and over. Um, but that's why, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't try to be righteous with the kids. Um, they know that I'm flawed and I don't hide that from them. I'm pretty transparent with how I coach them. Um, and they know my failings. But I tell them, you know, I'm not trying to uh, make you guys perfect, but I do want to make you guys better um, than what I was. Um, now, can you describe some of the emotions that it, like, if I, if something happened like this, you know, like, when you are in trouble, it's like, you don't even want to walk in a room because it's like, you know, you're going to feel like the darkness staring at you or something. It's like, and a lot of people, it's either when bad situations come on, people run away or they bat up to it. And it's like, what should the emotions feel like when you're trying to, stick up for it and you got to kind of like attack it. I feel like so many people run away from the problems and it makes it so much worse. Um, I don't know if this answers your question, but like the big thing for me is, is kind of just goes back to that family thing. Like I'm, I'm really spoiled that regardless of what I do, my family's always there and they're like, don't worry about it. We'll get through this. Um, you know, that's, it's a testament. My wife's like that. My, my brother's sister's parents are like that. Uh, my wife's family's like that or they're, you know, when I do make mistakes, they're all there and like almost enable me to uh, to keep messing up. But um, it's easy for me to stand up and say hard truths. It's easy for me to stand up um, and be accountable. So I don't that part doesn't stress me out. Um, and then with the, all the people I have in my corner, it's pretty easy to, uh, you know, to keep on going. Um, again, I I do better when my back's against the wall. I've had moments like when I was playing in the NFL, um, you know, there was moments that I was so depressed because there was so much stress that I we would be flying on the airplane. I'd be looking out the airplane like, man, I hope we crash. You know, like it wasn't like I was suicidal, but it was like I just kind of wanted it to end. You know, like, yeah, just so much on it. you know, there's so much pressure. Um, things are so good and everybody's looking at me like, wow, this, you know, he's, he's living the life. Like, um, and yeah, I don't want to mess it up. And then so I'd rather it's somebody else. <laughs> like I'd rather the, the airplane just crash. <laughs> or something like that, you know, and it sounds kind of weird. Yeah. Um, but again, when things are going really well, I'm always looking at myself like, man, I'm going to fuck this up. You know, I'm going to mess it up. Um, and then when things are bad, I have so many people on my, on my side, on my team that help me to uh, 
yeah, they helped me to come out of that, that funk. Um, so yeah, I don't know what other people go through, but for me, that's what makes it easier um, to come out of those hard times. Okay. I hear a lot of people say, don't choose a school to go to because of a coach. But it was like, how do you not choose a coach? Because that's who you're gonna learn from all the time. Like why I chose Idaho State over Hawaii was because I felt like I was gonna learn from you more than the guy that was at Hawaii. So what's some of your advice on choosing a school? Yeah, I think that you do have to be careful picking with a coach just because coaches, you know, they're not stuck there. You know, and coaches in this business, everybody's moving. Um, but obviously that's, that's a big part of it is just getting a feel for um, who you're going to be dealing with on a daily basis. Those coaches basically become, you know, your parents um, while you're out there. So I still think that's very important in, in the recruiting process. Uh, but there are other things that you can look at. Obviously the school, you know, the programs that that school offers. Um, the, the location and the culture of those cities. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things that come into play, but yeah, I think you make your decision on the information you have and you try to make the best decision you can. You know, I got a nephew who's going through the process right now and I really try to, I really just try to keep my two cents to myself and let him make his own decision unless I see, yeah, unless I see there's something like I'm adamant about telling him. Um, but for the most part, you know, once, once you make a decision, you know, you kind of go within it. Just understand if you're making it for that coach, that can change um, at any moment. But there's a lot of other good things that hopefully you've put into the evaluation too. Okay. Uh, now you're coaching at Modern Day. Do you want to get back to coaching college football or do you feel like high school is a way for you? Like, like what, is you, what are your thoughts moving forward? Uh, Right now, I, I know I'm not ready for the stress of uh, what college brings. Um, you know, maybe in a couple years from now, you know, I'll be able to handle that stress. But I know right now I'm not ready for that. And, um, you know, that's not even something I want at this time. Um, I actually love modern day. Um, I'm writing a book about, you know, three of the, the best coaches um, in this era. And what's interesting is that now I'm getting a chance to be with one of the best, you know, high school programs and high school head coaches. And I'm kind of putting a lot of those uh, theories to the test. Um, and, you know, when I'm at practice, I'm just like observing and watching and seeing like, you know, what kind of makes this whole thing go. Um, and it's good for me to compare Coach Rawlinson to, you know, to those other coaches that, I'm, um, that I've been studying and, and writing about. So I love it. I love it there. Um, I think it's a good place for me for right now um, and what I got going. And then we'll see what happens in a couple of years from now. But yeah. um, when you say you're not ready for the stress of college football, like, you know, why you don't want that stress? Like, what do you mean by that? I mean, everything is just, it's just everything's a high pressure situation, right? So, um, obviously the season's high pressure, everything's wins or losses. Okay, then you go right from that, then you go into recruiting, which maybe that's even more high stress. You know, then you're, you're going to spring ball, which is kind of low. Um, but then you get right, really right back into recruiting with the, with the summer camps and, right, it's really just nonstop. And before you, you know it, right, you got a, a month off and then you're back in the season, um, you know, and I feel like a lot of stuff can compound in, you know, in one year and you, you just build a little bad habit here. Um, you know, like I was saying, I didn't drink for eight years before I got to Idaho State and even I was there for two years before I started drinking again. Um, but, you know, you have this, what happened was I just had this one bad, you know, like a bad season and I'm like, man, I got to just have a drink then that little step right there just becomes this, this slow fade into becoming like a, a bad habit that eventually caught up with me. Um, so I know right now the place I'm at, um, I wouldn't be able to handle that stress um, day in, day out. But hopefully, you know, if I just keep on this path that I'm going on and just trying to figure myself out, um, you know, I'm kind of open to anything in a couple years. And do you kind of look at your opportunity right now like, to kind of be able to give back and it it gives you a chance to slow down and you could feel like it gave you a chance to kind of like step back and reevaluate everything yeah well yeah for sure that's what happened you know and i coach and i do youth right so the youth program i'm a part of they've had some success too um so i just get to see football from a different perspective and um you know see it from a from a different world than, than being in college. Um, 
But you know, I don't feel like I'm giving back. I actually feel like I'm learning a lot more. Like being at Modern Day, I'm learning a lot. Um, with even with those little kids, I'm learning a lot of like uh, just ha figuring out like what's a better ways to coach. Yeah. Um, but no, I don't. I don't feel like I'm giving back as much as I'm getting from mm. from the kids. Okay. And tell me a little bit more about the book as you're writing. Yeah. So the book I'm writing is about um, playing for Belichick, Saban, and Urban Meyer. Um, and initially, it started off as this. Uh, I was trying to just get everything they had in common. Um, and now what I've done is I've taken that out. Um, I've taken a chapter out of it and um, as I was going through therapy I kind of figured out like all these things they kind of had in common is where I was falling short and that, so now I'm writing my kind of life story mixed in where I'm falling short of what they did really good. Um, what, do so you, the, what do you think that is? Well so my book's called C's Get Degrees right um, and for me that was like that was my model like going to, to, to uh, school was if I would get C's, that'd be good enough to get a college degree, high school degree, but it'd also be just good enough for me to play football. Um, so I just kind of half-assed my way through, through school, um, but I excelled at football. But really what happened is, if you're really good at one area of your life and you're really bad at another area, you just become like this average person. You know, like um, you become a really not well-rounded person. That's what happened to me, right? So. That's just what the saying is, the C's get degrees, but um, the book is, every chapter I talk about is a C word, and then um, the amount you put into that is the degrees of separation, right? So I think I talked to your kids about this mm -hmm. when I was at your camp one time, but um, the first thing it starts with is, if you have a strong core, right, that's where everything starts. If you know who you are, um, and that's something I, that I kind of struggled with, was just knowing who I was, exactly what I wanted to do. But when you have this strong core, right, that leads to this high level of clarity, right? So when you have a strong core, leads to this high level of clarity. When you have this high level of clarity, then you start to maximize your competence, right? Now you're starting to maximize your skills. Once you start to do that, then you see your confidence grow, right? And when you start to have this level of confidence, okay, then you get this level of commitment, right? And so um, what I say for commitment is confrontation breeds commitment. So when you have a strong core, right, you have all those things, then when you're confronted and you run into these hard things in life, right, then you have this strong level of commitment to, to who you are and what you're gonna do, right? When you have that high level of commitment, it turns into this high level of consistency, right? And then once you start to do all those things and it starts to become this cycle, then you'll see this compound effect, right? Um, and when you start to get that cycle rolling, um, that's when your life really starts to, uh, show results over time you know so i was talking about like the stress of college coaching um that's kind of what happened to me when when i started to hit that stress level that i you know i couldn't take it right i started to make these bad choices because i didn't kind of know who i was or i didn't know how i was going to respond to that stuff and regardless of what you do and the decisions you make right there's always going to be this compound effect in your life so when i started making these bad choices Really what happens is it might be a small choice now, but as that, that wheel starts spinning over days, over months, years, right, it starts turning into this big, bad habit. You know, it's about 50 chapters, um, and I just talk about every, everything about um, kind of being a person, being a coach, like what, what I saw with good coaches, um, and I just kind of try to tie that together with, you know, so it's kind of my life story and lessons from these coaches kind of mesh together. Um, and the title just kind of perfectly explains my life is um, I wasn't fully committed to, you know, having a strong core. So the degrees I talk about in, in that is like when you have a strong core, you're like right 90, 100 degree like ranking. Right. Mm -hmm. For me, I was probably at like a 50, 60 degree rank. And then when you have all of those, that's the degrees of separation. Um, I believe that separates the good from the bad. Um, the good, you know, the, the great from the elite. I think that's what separates people. It's just those little degrees. Like everybody knows everything I just said. You know, every average person knows when you hear, oh yeah, be consistent, commitment, all that stuff. Um, but the amount you like invest into that, each one of those will separate you from everybody else. That, that's my premise of the book. There you go. Um, and kind of speaking up on that, I know you just tell us a couple stories like you felt like in college,